Hello, and thank you for joining the workshop. I'll get started by a quick introduction to our B Pollinator and Game Design um, Project-Based Learning Workshop. Um, so I'll start um, by just going over what I'll talk about today. Um, we'll start with a quick introduction to myself and my co-host, and then we'll pop into um, why I think project-based learning and community-centered design projects in particular are great for learning, um, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And then we'll go into um, the specifics of the different components of the project, including um, learning about bees and pollinators, and then using that knowledge for a new no tech coding project and then different ways you can level up um, the experience for your students based on their age and their, um, the time that you have and your learning objectives. Um, so to start, I'll start with an introduction to myself. My name is Marcy Klein. Um, I am a pediatrician. I was a pediatrician for over 20 years before um, co-founding our company, 3 Ducks Design, with the two cuties on top, my daughter, Ayana, and my son, Ethan, who um, developed the 3 Ducks Design modeling system. And what they developed was over to the left of your screen, um, basically connectors that are designed to fit on all single ply cardboard with the idea that kids can develop and build um, incredibly complex three dimensional structures quite simply and easily with the use of those connectors rather than um, using duct tape and glue. And they 3D printed hundreds of these connectors and went to local farmers markets. And what I saw at the farmers markets was pure magic. Um, kids of all different ages, in fact, adults were loving um, building with cardboard, um, but I saw so many opportunities for deeper learning in there and um, team building and all the softer skills that um, I have been working ever since to help them develop um, project-based learning experiences to augment um, their product, but also really that students can use um, with any cardboard or basic craft materials that they have in their home. So I'm gonna give it over to Maddie for a second to introduce herself. She's my first co-host ever. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am Bonnie Kirkley, and I have the website and teacher resource company, I Heart Steam. I'm an educator for the last 19 years, but 14 or well, 15 now in STEM and then STEAM. And Marcy and I connected on my podcast, the I Heart Steam Teacher Podcast. I'd love for you to listen. And I also do have a teacher course in university to help teachers integrate and I'm so happy to be here with you. So community-centered project-based learning is something that I think is an incredible tool for learning both in the classroom and out of the classroom. By tying your project-based learning experiences to community um, especially through things like urban design and architecture, it really brings every individual subject into one, into one full um, authentic learning experience for students. So as students are designing um, structures and environments, they're using their math and their engineering skills but they're also focused on the community and how they see their own community, the things that they love about their community and some of the challenges in their community that they, that they feel could be um, improved on. So things like culture and, um, you know, different diversity within their community is tied to their projects, as well as geology, climate, the natural environment, the animals that live in the environment. So when students are working on community-centered projects, it really brings everything from the outside world that they experience every day into the classroom. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I love projects and through this B um, activity, you'll see just one example of how we can integrate community-centered design into learning experiences for students. Um, so in particular, this project, we're gonna go over the Bee and Pollinator Pathway Project 
And then there's going to be um, how we gamify it and use no tech coding integrated into the project. And then I'll be sharing with you um, some extensions, including how we can bring LED lighting and create circuits and motors and um, some more engineering and physics experiments as we, if we want to, um, you know, skill up our project with extensions. So part one of the project is learning about bees and pollinators. So we have available in the lesson plan, um, you know, resources for your students. We have a student worksheet and we also have um, a facilitator guide for educators to lead the discussion on bees, um, their life cycle, their natural habitat, um, pollinator pathways. And included in this project, hopefully, if you are able to, is a chance for community-centered research. So students can use the resources within their own community. Maybe you have a local Audubon um, or you have um, you know, beekeepers in the community that are willing to come in for a classroom visit and talk about bees and pollination, and local resources and how their community um, is set up for supporting bees and how we might improve um, supporting bee habitats in our community. Um, municipal agencies also, um, like the town conservation department, might have resources for your students to research as well. Um, but we also have a ton of content available for you. So we have a number of different videos um, that go over the bees life cycle, their natural habitats, pollination um, that you'll be able to access from the lesson plan um, and watch YouTube videos. Um, Bonnie, I will let Bonnie talk about um, the virtual field trips. Um, she has a number of teachers pay teachers resources. Um, and then we also have a hands-on um, project that your students can do where they're creating a mobile and um, labeling the different parts of the bee's life cycle while they're building it. And I'll give Bonnie a chance to talk a little bit about her, her lesson plans as well. Yes, so I have, I've been curating, I mean, I guess it started with COVID obviously, like virtual field trips, learning, inter interactive learning experiences for teachers. So what topic are you teaching? Here is a curated experience so you can go and find everything. You don't have to search for it and it's been previewed and it's ready to go. So I've got one for students where they get to become a beekeeper and see what it's like. And that's literally one of my favorite ones because what's available out there all over for bee conservation, it, there's so much. So it, it's just one of my most favorite ones. And then of course, um, I've had a lot of project-based learning experiences because I know that some teachers sometimes like, ah, oh, I don't know enough content. I don't think my students will for doing this project. So that's actually part of a project-based learning experience is doing a little research. So I've made resources where the research is sort of there for you, like with a reading, a story, the background, and maybe, you know, a few other little activities to do ahead of time before you actually get to the project. So you don't have to worry about not having the background knowledge and, um, that you need or that your students need. Great. Uh, so always good. Okay, so once the students do all of their research, um, it's time for them to get building. So if you have three dogs cardboard and connectors, then you can use that to build a community, but you don't need that. So you can also just as easily use duct tape and cardboard, or you can even make um, a paper town, or you can use Lego. You can really use any modeling material um, for the community build. Um, so the students will start out by building like what their community really is. And after they've done their research, incorporating into it, what are some of the things that help bees survive in their community? And what are some of those hazards that maybe are not so healthy for bees in their community? 
And then once they're done with that build, it's time for them to start brainstorming ideas based on their learning and their research. How can they improve the environment for bees to improve their chances of survival in their town? And they can incorporate that um, into their community build and also into a presentation. So it gives them the problem, researching it, and now it's time to start designing solutions um, and presenting those solutions to the group. Um, once they are done with the actual build, then it's time to have some fun. And this is where we can plug in some of the no tech coding components that um, is my add on feature to this project. So I'll let Bonnie start by talking a little bit about no tech coding because she's the one who got me over the hump. Um, I've kind of been afraid of the word coding forever. It tends to go like right over my head. It's like, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'll stick to the cardboard. So she's helped me kind of understand it and I'm no longer afraid of it. So if I'm not, hopefully your students won't be either. So I'll let you start with that part. Okay, I'm just going to first just give you like a visual because it always helps me to be able to like visualize something. But if you can visualize a twister board and that is the perfect, perfect resource in your classroom to do unplugged coding like with the whole body. But visualize that twister board, you know, you've got your grid, I think it's like four colors and six dots going down for each color. So there would obviously be like one circle up in the top left hand or right hand corner wherever you wanted to and that would be like where you would start. So there's a deck of action cards, I like to make sure that I use the word action so the kids can I mean well that's a lot of their standards in ELA you know um so I use action cards so the kids have to look at the board and figure out how to with no hands you know like move a person or a robot or a bee from point A to point D on the board with out touching it with by giving it an action so that's what the action cards do the action cards are actually like what a programmer does when they write code they are giving the computer one step at a time and that's literally what they do is one step for each little thing that you see um like on this page right now so um, that's what they do and what they can do when you do the whole body or the physical, you can do it small with pieces like this, but with that twister board, you have the action, action cards. One person can call out the action and the person on the board actually has to move. So if it says write one space, the person on the board moves. And so if there's a problem in the code, then the person will not end up on the right space on the board and then the kids go, oh no, that's not where I wanted you to go. I wanted you to go that way, that way, that way. But it has to be in that deck of cards in the order. And basically that is all that it is, you know? And it's kind of something actually, I bet some of you probably have, if you have ever taught North, South, East and West before, some of us will get our kids up like whole body movement and we'll, you know, do we'll have some little North, South, East, West, you know, Southeast, Southwest cards and say like one step North, you know, that kind of thing. It's basically this that exact same thing. And the, at this point, you know, you just have a, a card for every space that you move and it's kinesthetic and it brings the abstract to life and to see, it gives them a visual. And I, the first time I ever did it, this is exactly what I did was get on that board and I totally made a mistake. <laughs> Totally, totally. And I went, oh, so you're also having to like visualize that um, in from one point to another, how you're going to get there. So that's what a great, great, great processing um, task to go through. Great. Well, thanks. Um, that was a good introduction. Um, so I'll go over now how we use those um, skill sets in a game design. Um, so drawing from the students' knowledge of what they learned about in terms of um, the bees 
and the things that they need to survive and the things that would pose a hazard, we're gonna use those in the game design. So um, if you've had a chance to print out or received the kit, you'll find um, some different task cards already made. Um, so we have bees. I added a bunch of cards that represent all the different types of um, things that bees need to survive, in, which is also what all animals need to survive, including shelter, um, in their case, food, which is plants and water. Um, so the idea for this game is that the students have a start and an end point, and the bee will need to hit five different survival cards, but avoid all of what I call the hazard cards. So on the, the form also, you'll see some things. Um, here's a whole sheet of hazards, including like chlorinated water and things that cause pollution. Um, so they'll have hazard cards and then they have survival cards. They get a chance to lay out the game um, by taping down the, um, the different cards and then they start at the beginning and they can end either at the end or if they want you know the hive is what i used as our end and they're going to go through the process one step at a time um, through the process um, to get to the goal um, so in terms of materials um, i have all of the sheets able to be printed for you um, the game board um, is um, blank. So you can tape as many of these together as you want. Um, I have direction cards with the actual direction on them, um, but you don't necessarily need to use the color-coded direction cards for the early learners, and I'll explain that a little bit after. Um, if you have the three dots connectors, I know I have a, a little turkey here somewhere. Of course, I can't find him now. Luckily, you guys can't see my desk. Oh, here it is. Um, so you can use the three-way cardboard connectors like this to create little feet um, for a lot of your cards. So on the right, you can see I used it with the bumblebee to create a game piece. If you don't have the three ducks connectors, you can use a paper clip like I showed you to the right. That would work just as well to create um, stand up characters. Um, so all of these materials are pretty much what you need. And then scissors, obviously, to cut out the, the shapes, um, markers. If your students discovered um, things in their own community that are helpful for the bees or harmful, they should use the blank cards and create their own hazard and survival cards. That really brings it into their own community and their own experience and gives them a little bit of ownership of their project. Um, and once they have all those materials, if they did the community build, um, you might have the three ducks connectors and cardboard. We also do have a map that you can use for the community build that already has some roads on it and is really nice for, for all students, but especially the early learners because it helps them lay things out um, in, in a way that's easy to incorporate into the game. Um, so again, there's two different ways to play the game. One is on the paper that you create your own board and the other would be on the project, the first project, which was the built community. And I'll show you how they both work soon. Um, setting up the board, um, we usually recommend two to four players. Um, so they're gonna all work as a team to build out the board, but then each student will have an opportunity to use their own coding skills to build out, um, to, to lay out the pathway. And of course, there's more than one possible pathway. So each student will have their own pathway um, and that's where the coding actually comes in. Um, here is an example of what a board might look like um, with all the different components. Um, so here's an example of what it would look like. Um, so I broke this up. I took it a little bit earlier than, um, than Bonnie described for the earliest learners. So ultimately, students want to be able to do this mentally. Um, but when you're in kindergarten, they may have a hard time doing that. So on the board, whether it's on the, the city bill to the right or on the paper board to the left, the students can actually start at the beginning and just lay out the arrows. 
your earliest learners can just use the colors for fun, but just use the direction cards based on the direction that they're going. That's educational enough for them. Um, but ultimately, ideally, they would learn on the cards that the blue means go to the right, the green means go up, and they would use the appropriate cards for the appropriate direction. Um, and then they're just gonna lay out the pathway. Um, if they have the paperboard, you can see that they're actually covering the survival cards as they go. That's basically equivalent to quote, collecting that card, but they have to avoid the hazards, otherwise the bee dies. Um, when you're doing the, the board in a city build, I'm gonna share the video with you over here to the right. Um, as you can see, it's not, they're not standing on top of the hazards or the, um, the survival cards, they're bypassing them. So as you can see first, the bee is passing by the factory, but he's not gonna stop at the factory. And then he goes past over here, the flowers and the flower shop, he's going right past it. So that's quote, a collection. Um, and then as we move further, there's a hazard, he's gonna avoid that by turning. Um, so that's how you would play the game on the actual city build. Um, next level is when the students are actually using their action cards or their arrows below the game. So now they really have to mentally think through one step at a time. Um, so that's leveling the project up a little. So on the left, you can see how they are doing that on the paper game. And on the right, you'll see how they can do it on the, on the board. So it's not actually going through the city, but it's just laid out below the city itself but it basically does the same thing. Um, when the students are done with their quote directions and all of their all of their instructions to decide if they've done it right or not, then they can pick up each piece and start laying it out on the board. And if they actually wind up covering a hazard card, then the bee dies. And if they got it all right, then their bee survives. When you're playing with a bunch of students, it's really fun for them to try to see who gets the shortest pathway to success. So that can gamify it a little bit more and make a little bit more of a competition out of it. Um, so that's the basics of the coding component. Um, you can level this up with different types of technology. So I'm gonna start with like slightly lower tech. Um, if you want to incorporate LED lighting and circuits into the project, it's really easy to do that. Um, you can just light up either, maybe the students want to light up the end when the character gets to the finish line, or maybe if they have a red light, um, they could light up the hazard um, cards um, and rig those up so that when the bee passes those, the light goes off and then the bee dies. Um, so you can rig it, the students can rig it up how they want. Um, but the way it basically works um, is I have a whole worksheet for your students. They can learn all about electricity. They can learn about um, renewable energy and non-renewable energy. Um, and then they can go through all the different types of circuits. This is basically a simple circuit that's open. And the way the circuit will close um, will depend on what they have. So if they have um, a character like ours, we put copper tape on the character's feet. So when the character steps on the open part of the circuit, he's actually gonna close the circuit and the light will go on. So I'm gonna show you how that works to the, the middle picture. So this little guy has um, tape on his butt, it's copper tape. And when he stands on the open circuit and closes it, it creates a light. So it's a really fun way to um, ramp up the learning a little bit, but make it also a really fun add-on to the project. Um, here is an example of another way that you can really increase if you have robots and the school that did this project just happened to have the bee bot. Um, but you could use any robot that you have. Um, it doesn't have to look like a bee to represent after the students have done the task cards, then they can program their robot to do the same thing. Um, so you're just basically leveling up. Um, I won't share with you now, but we have a video of one of the students from this project. They did a little side project where they created bee habitats 
um, and in her habitat, I'll share the link with you. You'll get this whole PowerPoint, by the way, so you'll be able to kind of go through this or share it if you want. Um, she has, you know, the different components of a bee's um, habitat that it needs for survival. And my favorite part of the whole video is that the end, she thinks she did an awesome, quote, awesome job, which is what we want all of our students to feel when they're done. Um, she even talks about some of the parts in her project that were extremely hard to do. So it's, it's, it's a fun watch. Um, another way to level this up, um, especially um, if you want to incorporate language arts into the project, is have your students um, come up with a more complex game. Let them create their own rules. Um, coming up with rules is hard enough, but writing down your rules in the form of instructions so that other people can actually understand it is incredibly hard. If anybody's ever written a lesson plan here and then shared it with someone and everybody's like, what? That's exactly what the kids are gonna go through when they're creating their instructions. So they write their instructions, they share it with peers and see if their peers understand it. And if they don't, that helps them understand how they need to write their instructions a little bit better. So that's another way that we can add on fun. And um, lastly, um, this is a new project for me um, using motors. Um, so these are vibrating motors that we can add to little bees that you can make out of cardboard. Um, so you're learning again how to make a circuit, but with this project, there's a lot of friction involved in making this little bee go straight. Um, so they're learning um, engineering design because once they make their bee, they have to figure out how to balance the forces on both sides so that the bee, they'll typically want to run around in circles if you use a vibrating motor. So by balancing the friction on one side versus another, you're basically like creating a rudder essentially on, on a boat. Um, and the students have to figure out how to make that B go straight. So you're bringing in physics, you're bringing in electrical circuits, but you're also bringing in a whole lot of trial and error and engineering design in the project. Um, in the end, I'll share with you an example of, um, of the other part of this is that they have to create the track. Um, so if the kids are smart enough and um, can figure it out, if their B tends to go one particular direction, they can actually design their track to go that direction too, to help their own specific B go the right direction. Um, and the rule will be that every track needs to be the same length, but you can design it however you want. Um, so here's one example of a project. Ready for measure. Cardboard, a vibrating motor, Pipe cleaners and heat ups connectors are all you need to get your bees ready for the races. Improve their engineering and critical problem solving skills. So in this example, I used the vibrating motor. I used um, two legs for pipe cleaners and one was our connector. And as you can see, my bee wanted to go to the right continuously. So rather than giving up and getting really frustrated, I redesigned the track so that the bee would have an easier time going to the right. And as long as the length of the track is consistent with all the other students, that is part of the rules of the game, it's totally fair. And then the students can have a great time racing their bees to see who wins. Um, I think that's the, the end of the three components of the project. Um, from from three outside, um, you can use this QR code if you don't have a phone on you right now. I'm going to share this whole PowerPoint with you to find more projects and activities. And then I'm going to hand it over to Bunny and then we'll open it up to questions. Hey guys. And so these are just those resources we were talking about. Um, if you want some extra things, but I've included another um, B coding activity with um, some stories and that kind of thing for you. Um, and I want to say that if you love integrated multidisciplinary lessons in your classroom where you cover your science and you, you actually do use your math and you do some of your math standards and you like project-based learning, I do have a course and there is a wait list for Sydney University coming up really 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 soon in a um, revamped way and I just want everyone to understand how to do it easily 
and not feel intimidated about using steam anytime during the day and that it doesn't have to be a separate time at all because you don't have much time and you uh, need resources that allow you to give your students a reason for what they're learning. And that's what project-based learning does. So what Marcy is so great at. And when they have a reason to understand their angles, like with the um, track design or any of these projects and they're motivated by it, uh, they want to learn the skills more because if they fail because they didn't have a necessary skill, then they're willing to actually, okay, I want to learn that. So but most of the time they truly enjoy projects and they don't even feel like they're learning very, you know, they don't feel like I'm doing math. So, or I'm doing science. So in that way, I would like to invite you to join the wait list. And the first thing that we tackle is something super, super easy, but that we miss as teachers. So um, I'd love for you to join us and find out what it's all about. Thank you, Marcy. Sure. Um, so this is a range of other products. Mostly what I recommend for the classes is the one in the bottom middle, the go box, because it has all the connectors and cardboard. We do have ones with LED lighting. But again, this whole project can be done with materials that you already have in class. And lastly, I'm going to share, um, you will, I'm going to email um, out a link to this video recording and the PowerPoint. And I got obsessed with Bitmojis one night. So on this Bitmoji, which is in the PowerPoint, you will see the teacher is actually my daughter. So if you click on her, you can read her story and how she came up with the idea for 3 Ducks Design. Um, on the board on the back are a whole bunch of free lessons and projects that you can access. If you click on some of the products on the shelves, they'll link to the products that those are associated with. And then right behind my daughter, Ayana, is a student showcase. So you can click on that and get links. We love to share student projects. We have projects from, I think, five different continents at this point. And you can see how how much of their culture and who they are as a community comes out through the different projects on that showcase. It's great for you to get ideas about how students tackled or other educators tackled some of the projects that we did, but it's also great for your students um, to share with them because a lot of the projects have stories behind them and the students share their story and you get so much of their own culture and who they are as students and where they're from through looking at their projects. Um, so it's a good way to kind of introduce kids to other students and other communities around the world through the students that live there. Um, so that is, I believe the conclusion. Um, you'll have a link over here to some fun cardboard hacks. So if you have, everybody has cardboard, I'm assuming, accessible. Um, so here's some fun engineering ways that you can use the cardboard that you have in your classroom. Um, so you'll be able to, they're all like one to two minute videos on like how to do specific activities with cardboard. So that concludes the workshop. Um, I would love to entertain questions, comments. Feel free to unmute yourself or um, show your face if you want. Um, but we're here for answering any questions. <laughs>